What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Down Dog Athletics Podcast, a competitor's guide to mental health and mastery. I'm your host, Paul Klingen. I'm a former D1 baseball player, currently a yoga instructor and personal trainer out of Seattle, Washington. And this podcast and Down Dog Athletics is all about bridging the gap between yoga and athletics, specifically for men, athletes, uh, hyper-competitive, and really just trying to help people that might have a stigma around meditation, yoga, and mental health, and help them cross that bridge. Today's guest is Jeremiah Bear. He's the owner of Bear Fit out of Nebraska. He's an online coach, personal trainer, and nutrition coach, and he has some of the best content on social media. He had his own huge transformation, lost a ton of weight. Really excited for you guys to hear his story. So without further ado, Jeremiah Bear. Jeremiah, thanks for coming on the show, man. Dude, thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Yeah. How's that? So you're over in Nebraska, yeah? Yes, sir. Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska. I love that. Um, I'm excited to have you come back out. We met uh, a few months ago in Seattle, and so it's always nice to be able to connect. But I think one of the best things we have you do to start is just kind of talk about how you got into training. Uh, we were talking off screen about what you went to school for, but I'll let you get into that. Yeah, for sure. So for me, um, I played football in high school. I wasn't really into it. I wasn't into lifting or training, nutrition, anything like that until my junior year. <laughs> I've told this story so many times, but like for me, honestly, what got me into it was before every football game on Friday night. So on Thursday night, all the seniors would give a speech to like get us hyped up for the game, right? One of the seniors was like giving this super serious speech, but at the same time, he was doing this like the peck paw thing, you know? Yeah. And me and my homie just thought that was the funniest thing ever. And we were like, dude, by next year when we're seniors and we're standing up there, we are going to be able to do that. So straight up, that was like what got me motivated. That was what first got me lifting. Just I thought it'd be hilarious to be able to do that. Now, that said, I think I talked to you about this before. I was homeschooled until eighth grade. So like – and I am, I look athletic, but I'm like the most unathletic, uncoordinated person in the world. So I straight up never had like much confidence at all. So when I saw like how lifting could change my body so quickly, and then because once I got in the weight room after that, I was changing crazy quick. It was like people were actually noticing, and I was like, oh shit, this is, this is cool. This is something that I can actually use to get attention. And as messed up as it sounds, like, feel better than other people which is where my mind was at at that point so from there got to where I could do the peck pop thing which was pretty hilarious but from there going into college um I got super obsessed with lifting like taking it back to that idea of like that being the thing that helped me get more confident I thought like okay once I get to a certain point, once I look a certain way, like if I just push this far enough, eventually I'm going to be happy with myself. I'm going to be good with myself. I'm going to be confident. Um, but yeah, it really, really wasn't happening. Like I wasn't getting any sense of fulfillment from that. I felt like I couldn't really connect with anybody. And that was straight up like all through college. That was pretty much my story, man. Like I just felt so awkward straight up I had no idea how to carry on a conversation with anybody literally I felt like all I cared about was like the gym now those was like the end of my college career like I told you I had a business I was studying business I started nutrition exercise and health because I was interested in all this um but I really just cared more about partying so I failed chemistry twice had to switch out so I said business was fairly easy so I switched to business so into college I was like, well, I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. I've always kind of thought it'd be dope to be a personal trainer. So I started training at the rec center and straight up, I hated it, dude. None of my clients, like the only clients that could afford it um, were the foreign exchange students that could speak English. So it was like absolutely nothing against that at all, by the way. But it was just like none of my clients can speak English. So I had no idea like how to help these people. But eventually had this dude come in. Um, his name was Daniel. Dude's goal was to lose fat. And he, we were working together a couple times a week. Dude just started crushing it. Um, one day he came in, he said, it was just the littlest thing, but for me, it like sparked. I'm talking about like why I'm passionate about this. This was like what flipped the switch for me. He came in, he said, so I've always shopped at J. Crew. 
I've never been able to buy a pair of pants from J. Crew because they don't make clothes for fat people. I was just finally able to buy my first pair of pants. No way. And for me, I, it's just the littlest thing, but I remember like up until that point, I was literally, literally so concerned because I felt like I didn't have like, I literally didn't care about anything but lifting. Like I didn't feel like I could like feel empathy for people or anything like that. But I was just so stoked. And like ever since then, I was like, all right, dude, I got to, I got to chase this. Like, I want more of this feeling. I want to help more people with this. So for me, long story short, that's really like where my passion for all this came from. And like, since then, I've honestly just been chasing that. And I feel it like that was like the most fulfilling thing for me. So that's why I love training so much now. Yeah. And I think that's a really cool story. It's that feeling that you get when you help people and you make a difference. And you didn't mention that feeling that you got when you signed them. You didn't mention that feeling that you got when you were done and you got to offload them. It's like, it's those little things. And what's oh, yeah. those that I try and get clients to realize and people to realize is the number on the scale. A lot of times it's not even a number in the weight room. It's that one person saying, wow, you look different. It's that, right. that you haven't fit in in so long, right? It's right. Like little milestones that aren't as measurable or you don't realize they're going to hit you. Sometimes they hit you when you're the least expecting it. And that's when it just smacks you right in the face. You're like, that's cool. That's why I do this. Or that's why a client all of a sudden sees their journey and how far they've come. Right. Awesome. Um, so you mentioned the personal trainer. You're also a nutrition coach. Where did you go to get those, um, those two certifications? So I have my personal trainer certification through ACSM. And then I have my precision nutrition level one coach. Awesome. Love that. Um, I went through NSCA and I'm looking at nutrition as well, but I think where I want to really talk about next is your own weight loss journey. You mentioned you really got really into lifting. You able to do that pec dance, which I also think is really funny. Uh, one of the <laughs> you know, you were at what, 1.245 and if you look at you now, you'd think that you're, you're in men's health and GQ on the reg. You're I'm so flattered, dude. Below 10% body fat. You look amazing. You're a tall dude. Uh, people haven't met him. He's well over six foot. Um, so take us through that journey from you started lifting, putting on muscle, but also putting on weight. We'll talk about that physical. And then after talk about kind of what was happening from mental side as well, how meditation played a role in that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So that bit that I just talked about, um, that journey through college, when I started college, I was 170. When I ended, I was 245. Now, again, I was just straight up obsessed with the weight room. I was doing all the bro stuff, like every single night before I go to bed, I would eat, I would eat an entire cup of tub of cottage cheese. Like I was going like literally everything you possibly do. Like, dude, I got to get bigger. I got to get bigger. And then, um, I was snowboarding and I separated my shoulder. So I really couldn't lift for what was a good three months. And during that time, I lost a lot of weight. So as soon as I could lift again, which I didn't realize at the time, like they give you like, okay, you're going to be cleared in eight weeks. I thought my shoulder was just going to be like good to go again in eight weeks. And the reality it took like 18 months before it was back to somewhat normal. And you can still see like now it sticks yeah. out like crazy. Um, but during that time, I lost a lot of weight. I was like, all right, I got to get back to 245. I'm small now. So as soon as I came back, I was just eating, 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 eating. And then that went on for a good, like, year, dude. And I was a pretty cute dude by then. And then one day I was just like, oh, my gosh. Like, yo, I am I, – like, I just felt huge, dude. So from there, um, I really just – like, for me, that was kind of the same time I was very disillusioned with um the whole like lifting thing like I realized that that wasn't something that was making me happy at all so I went on to lose like I went on a kind of keto diet and this is a lot of my like why I got into nutrition also because of this diet that I, um I straight up for what was a good six months dude I followed on Instagram was promoting like yo you got it if you want to lose weight you gotta eat ground beef and avocado, fast till lunch, ground beef, avocado, lunch and dinner, and night you're going to eat a banana and peanut butter. 
So it's like, all right, so I did that for six months. I lost 45 pounds. So I went from 245 to 200. But at the same time, I was, I felt terrible, dude. Like I straight up, like at the time, I didn't know anything about nutrition. I was like, okay, so it must've been carbs that were making me fat. When re- in reality, I was just eating terribly. Yeah. Um, but I felt terrible. I remember when I got done with that, I could literally do like one chin up, which for me, it was awful. Like everything on my body hurt. So that was when I kind of got into, sorry, this is kind of a drug ass story, honestly, now that I think of it, but that was when I kind of got into like, okay, none of this is really like making me happy. Like trying so hard now to get lean. Whereas before I was trying so hard to get big, like now I'm leaner. Like I could see my abs at this point, but I was like, still like none of this is fulfilling. So finally I realized like, I honestly don't think anything that I'm going to do physically is going to make me happier. Like I don't want people to, I don't want to identify myself with just like how I look physically. I want it to be more than that. So then I finally was kind of able to disconnect like me being happy or me being a more confident person with that. So then I started to focus more on like the mental side of things. So that was when I got very into meditation and honestly just learning how to like actually have relationships with people. That was also right around when I graduated college and I started working full time as a trainer. So I remember like the craziest thing for me honestly was just like how being vulnerable is almost like a cheat code for like building relationships. So I was like, like if you just are vulnerable with somebody and like put an insecurity out there, like they'll reciprocate you with something deeper than just like surface level conversation. Right. Right. So I remember all my clients, I was like, all right, I'm just going to be vulnerable as hell. So like all my clients, I would just be like, so this is what I'm feeling insecure about today. At first I'd be like, yo, what? But then like we would spark really good conversation. So for the next, honestly, I'd say for like the next two years, that is really truly like figuring out all that, like how to have relationships with people, how to be happy with myself and feel more confident without it having to come entirely like from, okay, I look jacked. I'm the biggest dude in the room. Like, and look at my abs. You know what I'm saying? Like learning how to have a sense of self and like figuring out what my identity was outside of that that was really all that I focused on and then let's see just actually right about a year ago I kind of started to feel like because I've been coaching for what I was three four years into being a coach at this point um and I really that was also when I really started putting a lot more of my content out there on social media I was really starting to feel like I wasn't like practicing what I was preaching because whereas before when I first got into lifting, I loved just like nerding out about training, things like that. I still did for like my clients, but for myself, honestly, like I was pretty much just half ass in my workouts. Like I didn't have that much interest in training myself. I loved learning about it and helping other people with it, but I didn't really feel like I was practicing what I was preaching. And I was starting to realize that for me, a big part of me, like, being happy in life and just knowing that I'm pushing myself to the fullest extent in every area of my life. Like if I feel like I'm leaving something on the table, I'm not happy. And it's always like there in my subconscious. Yeah. So that was actually when I started working with Cody McBroom. I kind of saw that because that was also when I kind of understood, started to understand the idea of what I talk about all the time, leveraging other people. Like for me, I had tried because I felt like that, like I wasn't practicing what I was preaching for quite a while. But I've been like, okay, this is the week I'm going to work harder in the gym. I'm going to just crush it this week. And then every week would be the same thing. This is the week I'm going to get my nutrition on point. And it wasn't working. So I finally realized, okay, so if I just, like, I'm working at a big box gym. I'm not making a ton of money. So if I pay somebody a large amount of money and have them hold me accountable, I bet I'm a lot more likely to follow through. So that was when I hired a coach of my own to hold me accountable. Um, I also, a big thing that I got into at the same time, which now I use a ton for my clients, is environment. So at that time, I was working out at the same gym where I was training. I was running like 60 sessions a week in person at the time. Wow. So for me, I just like, I absolutely, and I absolutely love training people. So don't like get this twisted at all. But when I would try to work out on my own, I would just like feel so lethargic at that gym 
um, constantly people would come up and be like, yo, will you help me out with this real quick? And of course I was like, yeah, no, for sure. And my workout would get pushed to the back burner. So I got a membership at another gym across town. And I would like set a very strict time block between clients where I had to like dip over there and work out quick. And just something about, honestly, I think there's a lot to be said for like new environments. I don't know if you've read the book, Atomic Habits. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he talks about like basically tripping over your old cues. So like for me, like I so associated that gym I was working out at with like when I would try to work out, like feeling the dark. So for me, just like going to a brand new gym, I was like, all right, in this gym, I just work my ass off. That's just how it is. And because it was a brand new environment, it was so easy for me to just like push it super hard there. So basically, let's see, when I started working with Cody, I think I was at 215. Um, my goal with that was to get in the best shape of my life, get the longest I've ever been. Because again, I felt like I was, I was telling people like, work with me, we'll get lean. But I didn't feel like I'd ever like fully been there. So like I, again, talking to like, I have to have like push things to the fullest extent to know, like be able to be content. I was like, I got to get there. Dude. Like, otherwise I'm just going to constantly feel like an imposter. So we dropped all the way to from let's see, 215 to the day. I did my photo shoot, which was nine months later to 180. Again, my skin full of calipers said I was about 6% body fat. I would guess is a little bit closer to like seven or eight. But I got pretty damn lean and learned a ton about fat loss in the process. And that was pretty much the journey, dude. Yeah. So a ton of stuff in there. First thing that I think about is what did you learn from a nutritional standpoint? Because you talk about pounding a whole thing of cottage cheese we talk about going up in weight and down in weight and i think for a lot of people they think oh i'm eating healthy i should be losing weight or i'm not eating healthy i should be gaining weight but what did you learn from an energy balance standpoint from a macro standpoint and tracking that that allowed you to get to where you wanted to get honestly the biggest thing i learned was like i thought when i started working with cody he was going to teach me like some crazy secret Honestly, the biggest thing I learned was that I was like lying to myself about how much I was eating because before it'd be like, like straight up when I talked about going from 245 to 200 the first time when I followed that kind of keto diet, after that, I'd always bounce from like 205 to 230 up and down, up and down. And that went on for like a couple of years. And it's always like, I would track super consistently. And then I'd be like, okay, this is kind of like what I'm guessing I mean, my calories are for the day. And I would just basically like for me to get down to that level, just like the amount of like how precise you have to be with everything. That was the biggest thing for me. And just how important consistency is to the whole process. Like truly he, and he wrote a giant blog about like my transformation also. And truly like, if you look in there, he's even like, yeah, like we straight up didn't do anything special. It was just being consistent as hell over and over again. And I mean, taking it from like a clean foods versus like dirty foods at aspect. Um, whereas before, like I talked about, like thinking it was carbs that made me fat, which obviously wasn't the case. Like the reality is as far as fat loss or fat gain goes, energy balance is the biggest driver. So obviously like if you're, you have to be in deficit to lose weight, we have to be in a surplus to gain weight. Now there's so many different factors that can affect that. But I think a lot of times people get too focused on like, okay, well, I'm eating carbs or I'm eating lots of healthy fats. Like I should be losing weight, right? That's, just, that's actually a super common one I see, especially with coaches that I've started coaching for whatever reason, like healthy fats, especially. And that's where I was like when I, again, sorry, I keep bouncing back to this, but when I talked about losing, like getting down to 200 the first time, then I was like, okay, well, I can eat as much fat as I want. So I started eating literally multiple ribeyes a day. I would grab two one pound ribeyes every day, eat them. And then I started getting weight again. I was like, yo, like, what is going on here? I'm eating, this is like, this is fat. Fat doesn't make me fat, right? So a huge part for me, and that I think so many people are missing, is like focusing on your macronutrients before you have like your overall energy balance in check is kind of missing the forest for the trees. Yeah. Makes sense? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, with what you were talking about too, and you talk a little bit about how maybe like fat versus carbs get stored 
because you're, you're saying you're having two ribeyes and you're like, this is healthy fat. And right. Based on the types of workouts that you were doing at the time, what is the body actually using for fuel, for energy from right. a cardio standpoint to a weight training standpoint, maybe get to the, the anaerobic. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. So basically for most people, and I mean, there are some ex exceptions, like some people do feel a little bit better on a bit higher fat, but generally, okay. So we have our protein needs, which for most people is going to be like between between 0.6 and one grams per pound of body weight, depending on where you're at. One gram per pound of body weight is a pretty good standard, like no matter where you're at, you're safe there. We have our minimum fat needs. So fat, again, is an essential macro. We do have to have a certain amount of fat. I call it like a fat threshold, which is typically 0.3 to 0.4 grams per pound of body weight. That's just what we need for optimal hormonal function. If you don't eat that, you'll feel terrible. You have nutrient deficiencies, you have EPA deficiencies. We, we do need that. From there though, we don't really get a lot out of driving fat any higher as far as our calories. So basically we set protein at about one gram per pound of body weight. We set fat somewhere around that threshold. If you do like fat a little bit higher, that's where from like an adherence perspective, if you just like more fat, less carbs, and that makes it so you can stick to your diet, then it makes sense to drive it higher. But then other than that, carbs are gonna do so much more. Carbs are gonna fuel our performance. Carbs are gonna speed up our recovery. So typically for most people, it makes sense to set protein and fat around those thresholds and then fill the rest of like your calories as much as you can with carbs. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that make that answer my question. And I think that's you articulated it in a really quick, easy way for a lot of the listeners to understand where if you are an athlete and you are training resistance training and right. you and you're just ignoring carbs or ignoring even just getting enough food, even just having energy before right. you build muscle. And it's like you can't build muscle if you don't have supplies. You can't oh yeah, you exactly, food. dude. And that's what fat is such a hyped up thing lately for whatever reason. Again, like talking about like, especially like other coaches that I work with, it's like coaches that have been trying to get lean and they are eating like a fairly low carb diet. And it's almost like most people I run into with this, they're not eating low enough carb to be keto, but they're really not eating very many carbs. So they're just kind of in like this purgatory of they feel like shit because they're not eating a lot of carbs, but they're also not fueled by fat really. So they're just kind of in between. Then they're also eating like tons of fat bombs, things like that, which is putting them in a big calorie surplus. So it's just like kind of a bad place to be in, if that makes sense yeah. for most people. Yeah, it kind of feels like the abyss, like you're in between two worlds, you need to pick one. And right, exactly, exactly. I think that's why, that's where someone like you is really helpful because you help them make those little minor shifts. Um, I think it would be really cool to hear about how you're able to do that from an online standpoint. You go and look at your before and afters from clients on um, your Instagram, and it's like you've been training these people side by side, like you're a celebrity trainer. Literally, it, like <laughs> it means the world to me, dude. Them through the entire 24 hour day for six months. But all you're doing, I'll let you tell us what you're doing. Like, what are you doing with these clients? All right. So, honestly, I think the biggest piece of this is seeing coaching as a collaboration. When I first started coaching, I thought it was like, all right, I'm going to tell these people, these are your macros, this is your workout, this is what you're going to do, do it. And that's what I did. And truly, like, nobody got results. So more and more, I try to, like, take my ego out of it. And when people come on, like, like we hop on calls, we communicate through emails. Yo, like, what for you? Okay, so here's some different things we do with our diet right out the gate. So like you could track macros, you could use your hands for portion sizes, you could just track calories for you. What's going to be the easiest thing to stick to? Do you prefer more carbs, more fat, just different things like that. Really first getting a good feel for them like right away, what they think they can stick to. I honestly think that that is the biggest key. And then I always tell people, my goal for you is it for you to rely on me as a coach for the rest of your life? Oh I think that's a big mistake, dude. That's for me. That was like one of the biggest mistakes I made when I started training. I was like, my client was like, because I wanted to over deliver so bad that I was like, I am going to do everything for you. Like, 
I got you, don't worry. But long term, did that give those people like life lasting results? No, yeah. they were just dependent on me. So I strive to as much as possible teach people absolutely everything I know about this. Every single adjustment, I educate them on why I'm doing this with their macros, with their training. This is why we have why we're doing what we're doing. I also have all my clients. I have an online, I have like an email course that gets geared to them every Friday that takes them through like everything I know A to Z about training, nutrition, even like mindset and environment change, like we we're talking about earlier. Just so like no matter what, I can know when clients leave, if they leave, that they like absolutely have all the knowledge to do all this entirely on their own. Yeah. And that's also something like with me not being there. The reality is like most people don't need me there to talk them through every single set. It's like if I give them the tools, I'll have them shoot me form videos occasionally so we can make sure all that's on point. I hold them accountable giving the training sessions in. So I see like the trackers, everything like that. But they don't need me there for every set. And it's really like helping empower them to be more independent, take ownership of this, and like make it happen yourself. And I'm just here as kind of like a sounding board. We're gonna go back and forth. I'm gonna ask you questions to get you out of your own way. Honestly, that's another big thing too. Instead of just prescribing, like being like, okay, so before I give you like what I think you should do, tell me like what, where's the blockage here? Like, what do you think happened or what can you do differently next time to make this a non-issue? Yeah. And so that is, and then like having people tell you instead of like just me prescribe, prescribe, prescribe. Okay, so like you didn't hit your macros this week. So this week I want you to try hard. Like, no, just like having them talk through, like, and then it's like, yo, look, you knew the solution all along, like you got this. But then if somebody gives you a solution instead of you just telling them what to do, that gives them so, them so much more autonomy. And then from there, they're so much more likely to follow through. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then like the accountability is honestly a huge piece of it also. The biggest conversation, like I've had this conversation with so many people lately, but the idea that like the biggest thing, I think that truly, I think like the biggest thing that drains people's confidence or makes people unhappy is like repeatedly telling yourself over and over you're going to do something and then not following through with it. And I think for most people, like a super glaring example of that is their fitness. And I know like this is how it was with me. And I've seen so many of my clients' confidence completely change. And I truly don't think it's because of how, like, visual changes. It's from, like, having somebody there to hold you accountable to doing all these little things daily that before you said you weren't going to do, but now you've invested financially, emotionally, you're scared to let somebody else down. Suddenly, you're, like, not that type of person anymore that doesn't follow through. You are, like, that person that follows through. And then you like build so much confidence in yourself over time by repeatedly doing that, that you're not going to let yourself down. That's what I do hold my clients very accountable. Also, again, it's not like a dependent relationship at all, all but I have them fill out an accountability sheet. It's a Google sheet that I see every single day where they have like their key behaviors to getting them to where they want to go. And I see that every single day I call them out, they don't fill it out. So that's a big part of it also. But I think just over time, I work to help them build more and more confidence independence and then also community with my other clients and our Facebook group and a lot of them are friends in person now too so they kind of help empower each other to push forward um, but yeah I really think in a nutshell very large nutshell I guess that's where the results come from yeah yeah and I think what's what's super cool about that is you're helping them build this it's what I call like the relationship with themselves they now trust themselves to do what they're going to say yeah, dude. I always like to say like if your if your mom says don't steal the cookies and she doesn't you know discipline you and you just keep doing it you're not going to believe her you know saying? right and you don't follow through you're not going to believe yourself so you right hold them accountable um and it's cool that you have that community as well that you do because I think that is so many things that people want in fitness is just community and having that Facebook group. Uh, I think people underestimate how valuable that can be. Oh, dude, it's so powerful. Um, cool. So you recently came out with a post with a movement hierarchy. Um, yes, I sir. Value out of this, and I think everyone listening to this that struggles with putting together programs can get a lot of value out of this as well. So I want you to talk through it. I'll also drop it in the show notes so that people can see it. 
for that. Right. Goes through how, what workouts do you need to do in what order, how many times per week in order to see optimal results? Okay. Okay. So basically, no matter what, most studies have shown that training each movement pattern slash muscle group twice a week is going to be most optimal. So basically, you have squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, and push, pull, we can break up into horizontal and vertical pushes, horizontal and vertical pulls, right? And then we have what we call anti-movement, which is basically just the ability to brace your core to resist any type of rotation, any type of movement, basically. So from there, if we break it down into those, what, five, six movement patterns, if we train all those twice a week, we pretty much train every muscle group in our body twice a week obviously there's like the slight variations but more or less we train everything in the body so for everybody that's gonna be your foundation now from there there's a very clear ratios of like just to be pain-free and to build like most optimally built muscle how often we need to train everything so basically the movement hierarchy is we have four different tiers i built it in the little pyramid because that's kind of the thing right now like Eric Helms, different pyramids, but basically our bottom tier, we have rows, hinges, and anti-movement. So basically the muscles on your backside, your posterior chain, glutes, hamstrings, back especially, are kind of like our foundation along with our core. If those are weak, your shoulders are going to hurt, your knees are going to hurt, your back's going to hurt. Those should always be our priority. Now, the reality of life is most of us like to train the muscles we can see on the front side of our body a lot more so we love to train like chest delts even quads so that develops a lot of imbalances we get slouched forward we get anterior pelvic tilts things like that so just putting a ton of emphasis on the posterior chain and the core is going to help fix that so for most people now you can really apply this to any type of training as long as you're training usually these movement patterns twice a week you want to work in three to four variations of each of those with me so far on that yep okay so that could be like okay you train if you train like an upper lower split then you're going to do two two hinging variations in each of your lower body training sessions from there the second tier we have a horizontal push which is going to be like a bench press push up something like that squat or lunge is kind of interchangeable and then a vertical pull, which would be pulling down from overhead. Those we want to train two to three times a week. We always want to be rowing more than we're pushing. That's something that people get wrong and why rows are on that very bottom tier. Rowing is super important. Our upper back is so key to stabilizing the shoulders. So many dudes, especially, just love to bench press, love to build the chest. And by the time they're like our age, 26, 27, shoulders are just so beat up. The solution to that for most people is straight up just rowing a lot more yeah. so we want so basically though getting back to we have a horizontal push our squat slash lunge and then a vertical pull two to three times a week tier above that we have a vertical push and then lunge is kind of in there again a lunge and a squat are pretty interchangeable i would argue for i only put the squat below the lunge and think of a lunge as like anything like a, any single leg movement, like a unilateral lower body movement, yep. so like a split squat, lunge, anything like that. Just if you can't squat on two legs, you're not going to be able to do on one, which is why I put the squat and the lunge is kind of interchangeable. But I would argue for most people, being able to do like a split squat really well is going to have so much more carryover to you feeling better in life and more quote unquote functional carryover than being able to do like a back squat. Like a lot of my clients are going back squat, but all of my clients, we work on a ton of different like, lunge variations just because that, I mean, that works to balance your stability so much more. And there are so many situations in life where we need to do something with like, primarily one leg. So I do think that has a lot of carryover. But so from there, and then overhead pressing, that vertical press is also in that tier. Just because straight up, we don't need to overhead press a lot. When we're doing our horizontal presses, our bench presses, things like that, our shoulders are already getting a lot of work. Another common mistake people make that beats up their shoulders too much is too much overhead work. So that compounded with all your horizontal work, it's just a ton of stress on the shoulders and we just really can't handle it. So that is just one to two times a week. 
And then finally, at the top tier, we have your isolation work, which would just be things like lateral raises, leg extensions, whatever. There, you really just add that as necessary to fill whatever voids you need. The reality is if you just train those tiers below that, you can still get great results. We don't need a ton of isolation. It's just kind of like the icing on the cake. Yeah. If you want that extra volume for the bicep, that's where that comes in. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what, like, I wouldn't skip that, but it's not a must. Yeah. And what people don't realize is when you're doing that horizontal row, or even that vertical row, depending on your grip, um, you're getting the bicep. Right. Where your muscle groups are getting worked. Um, right. We're like, oh, I want to work biceps. It's like, dude, we just supine row for you. <laughs> right. And I mean, again, it's like if you wanted to get jacked biceps, obviously we want to include some bicep specific work. But if you just want to feel good and move good, you could just live in those bottom three tiers and you'd be perfectly fine. Yeah. I love too that you talked about how anteriorly habituated we are. Everything we do is full reflection with the hips, with the shoulders. You roll forward with your neck because you're on your phone, you're on your screens, you're sitting at your desk, you're sitting in your car. Um, I noticed it a ton when I started practicing yoga a bunch, which is a very, it trains the front side of your body a ton, but there is nothing to pull against on a mat. There's nothing right. to that back. So that's when I started to notice a ton of problems in my body when I was doing like handstands or something like that. So I like to tell people, especially you recommend like, would you say a two to one or three to one with rowing versus pushing? Uh yeah, I'd say at least two to one. And I like, so you want to row. I like to say you want to row three times as much as you push, twice as much as you pull or vertically. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that ratio. And I think it's especially applicable to people that do something like yoga or do something that breaks that front side of the body with a ton of pushing. Right. And so that that formula, that hierarchy, I think is phenomenal. And we'll right. hear that after this, after it means this. the world, dude, anyone, anyone who's able to put together a program themselves and feel confident in the gym, but they're like, I don't know how often I should be doing things. You follow that. You're going to get to good places. Um, oh yeah. It'd be set. Yeah. So the last thing I want to do is just from a nutritional standpoint, what are five things people can start doing today that if they are consistent with, to your point, is going to allow them to see results and before people think that we're like giving away the magic secret a lot of the reasons why people don't get where they want to get is they don't have that accountability that's again where someone like jeremiah or having a coach becomes so beneficial but that said i want to hear those your five tips um so that people can start to do it themselves and in, you know see results if they're able to do it on their own Right. So first, I would say you need some type of structure. The biggest, most people that come to me, they're like, yeah, I eat healthy. I'm like, okay, how are you measuring that? So having some type of way to measure your intake, because if you are like eating clean, but you're not seeing results, you're probably eating so much or you're probably eating too much. So it doesn't have to be tracking calories. Again, it could be like a lot of my clients use a handful diet where we just measure portion sizes with our hands. But you have to have some way of measuring your intake so we have something to adjust off of if you're not making progress like typically like feelings like i feel like i'm eating clean i feel like i'm making good progress aren't really like a very good thing to actually adjust off of so we need to have, have some way to measure your intake two would be actually measuring your progress this is another big mistake i see people make is like okay i'm dieting and i feel like i'm losing fat but okay so like what are your metrics that you're tracking so it could be weight is a good one i don't love like strictly weight though because there are like body composition changes so i would say weight take progress pictures at least every month and then take body measurements that is a huge one so um i have my clients do like measure chest two inches above the navel two inches below the navel right over the navel hips thighs you need to be able to see First, we need to measure your intake. We need to be able to see like measurably how you're changing to be able to accurately adjust that. Because again, we're just strictly adjusting off feelings constantly otherwise. And like, <laughs> we're emotional beings, obviously. So it's very like, if we're constantly just adjusting off feelings instead of like hard data. 
it's hard to like get the end result that you want. Next, I would say weighing or having some type of way of measuring your food. So like tracking your food outside of like having structure, tracking your food is a good start. But again, we're terrible at like estimating portion sizes. And like I talked about for me, this was a huge thing, like actually getting my food on the scale. Some people hate the idea of this, like it seems a bit OCD. But the reality is if you want to get to like if you want to get crazy lean, you do have to get a little bit more intense with this. So I would say at least a week or two of like actually measuring out what a portion size looks like. Like when you weigh what two, what 32 grams of peanut butter is, it's hard breaking your first off of. But it like, it's mind blowing how much different it is than like when you just like have two, like, okay, on the, on the night, this is about two tablespoons of peanut butter, right? So just developing more awareness around that is huge. I would say eating 80 to 90% whole foods is another big thing, especially if your focus is fat loss, whole foods are just so much more satiating. So um, have you heard of palate fatigue? Mm -hmm. Bas yeah, so basically the idea is if we're eating a ton of whole foods, eventually we get palate fatigue. So those are extremely hard to overeat. Whole foods are typically less calorically dense and they're a lot more filling. They take longer for our body to process, so we're gonna be full longer when we're dieting. Whereas processed foods are literally just designed for us to be able to eat more and more and more, make us want to eat more and more and more. So I would say switching to 80 to 90 percent whole foods is a huge one. And then finally, just hitting that protein goal again, like just as a general recommendation, about 0.8 to 1 grams protein per pound of body weight is a good marker for most people. I'm guessing most people listening to this are going to be trying to get a bit leaner. So again, talking about satiation, protein is by far the most satiated nutrient. It's going to keep you full the longest. Also, protein has the highest thermic effect of food. So about 30% of the calories that you eat from protein are actually burned off during digestion. I think carbs are like 5 to 10%, yeah. and fat is like 3 to 5 or something like that. But you burn a lot more calories if you eat protein. So therefore, fewer calories can go to, and overall, just protein is a lot harder for your body to store as fat, harder than any other macronutrients. So it makes sense to hit that protein goal. Also, that will keep you a lot fuller. Yeah. No, that protein one I love. And there's a lot of studies, too, that show, like, you can eat more than a gram for body weight. Oh, yeah. Have negative effects. Like, you can overdo it. Um, right. Underdoing it is going to be a little bit more, I think, a little bit more detrimental than going one right. or 1.3. So if you're listening oh, no, to the protein, uh, that was the, the last of the tips. Thank you so much um, for one, coming on the show, two, giving us between the movement hierarchy and the nutrition coaching. I think if people just listen to that part alone outside of the story, they're going to have a ton of value, be able to take that home into their training, into what they're doing uh, from a working out training standpoint. Jeremiah, where can we find you? Uh, your website, social media. Again, I'll drop all these in the show notes so that you guys can yeah so my website is just barefit.com that's b-a-i-r-f-i-t.com my social media is just jeremiah bear at jeremiah bear on instagram and then on facebook it is just barefit cool love it man well thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh we'll definitely be following along and hope to see you again soon in seattle dude thanks for having me i'm stoked to meet up this weekend all right later dude See you, Matt. That was Jeremiah Bear of Bear Fit out in Nebraska. Hope this podcast brought some value to you, gave you some things to think around nutrition, around training, and around the mindset uh, that you may be in with your current training. I will drop the show notes and summary on my website, downdogathletics.com. There you can also get my free 28-day plan where I mix training, exercises, yoga, mobility flows, uh, nutrition, as well as some mindfulness techniques through journaling and meditation to kind of practice what I do with clients and what I do myself. Hope you guys enjoyed the podcast and I'll catch you next time on the Down Dog Athletic Show. Have a good one.